If you weren't here last week, I, I just encourage you to go back and listen to it on YouTube or off the website. Or listen, if you've got an iPod or uh, some type of device where you can, you know, uh, podcast and so forth, we, we do set our stuff up and, and place it out on, the, on our website. And you can subscribe to our podcast. If you have a Roku box, you can watch us and, and become part of, the, of our uh, network and see us on Roku. Um, praise the Lord. And watch it on your big screen. Which is pretty cool. Amen. You get to watch, you know, when you subscribe with the Roku box and stuff with you can you can download stuff and watch it on a regular television because it's a box that hooks up to your television. But you can get to our YouTube. You know, we do we YouTube, is that what we're doing, Bill? Or we just we just do Roku and post it to our site. We've got iTunes. iTunes. Blueberry. Blueberry. Uh, Roku course. Roku. And a website. website. And off the website. All right. So those are our features right now. Find us, download us, subscribe. If you miss it, get to see it. Amen. But the Roku box is just so cool because it's a little it's a little internet box you hook up to your TV and once you find get get our channel and stuff, uh, you can just go out there and watch the stuff and it's just on a on a big television screen, which is yes, Brother Bill. Uh, quick report, we got sixty eight households connected. Right now. And it's a private channel that's not advertised, so they're just finding out. Somehow. Finding out somehow. We need to advertise. Yeah, well, we're, we're waiting for approval for the full channel to be on the channel. Store Under review, okay. Everything you do with the internet, now they have to review you, make sure you're not some wacko. Yeah. And we're normal. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, you know, so how many remember the movie Young Frankenstein with uh, Gene Wilder? And uh, he goes to get the brain, and they got the, the normal brain, the abnormal brain, and that kind of stuff. And he picks up the normal brain and drops it. And so he, he just grabs the abnormal brain and brings it back. And, you know, of course, uh, the monster comes out. He's not right, quite right and stuff. He said, I told you you get a brain. He said, I did get a brain. He said, I told you you get the normal brain. He said, hey, I did. I got the Abby normal brain. <laughs> Name of the person was Abby normal. <laughs> We're just normal. Hallelujah. For, for Kara's crazy maniacs. Hallelujah. <laughs> Now we're going to get to a place we can start over. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're, we're coming and, and moving towards the end of our teaching on the purpose or be, and or benefits of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. As I was going to say last week, we got into uh, divine communication with the Father. Yeah, that was a really good time in the Word and the, and, and the Spirit. I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. There's just something about divine communing with the Father that, that is, is heavenly and brings answers to uh, troubles in life. There's things you get in the Spirit you're not going to get anywhere else. So we study the Word and feed on the Word, the Holy Ghost takes that and makes it alive to us and speaks to us out of His Word. Brings revelation and understanding. Hallelujah. As we commune with the Father, Spirit, Spirit to Spirit. Praise God. Oh, my, 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 my. It just, uh, it's, it's heavenly. I said it's heavenly. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll kind of kind of hit that verse a couple times and maybe just, just reiterate a couple things and head on to our next point. It says, follow after charity or love or agape, it's agape of the Greek, and desire spirituals. That's how the Greek really says it, things in heaven pertaining to the Holy Ghost, but rather that ye may prophesy, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue or a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. How be it in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Greek is uh, divine secrets. He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, this here should bring all the clarity you'll ever need about what Paul's talking about in these passages without getting weird. This right here. You don't, you don't need to get weird. You don't need to go, I don't believe in speaking tongues because Paul didn't. Now, listen, you can't say that Paul didn't believe in speaking tongues when Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yeah. You can't say he didn't believe in it. You can't say he didn't believe in it because at the end of this chapter, down in verse, around verse 29, he says, forbid no man to speak in tongues. 
I love that scripture because anybody who does is violating the word. Oh, we believe the word. Well, you, what, what other part says don't forbid people to speak in tongues? Well, we believe that passed away. Where give me the scripture says it did. I got one that says don't forbid. You don't have one that says they passed away. You got one you try to make it say something that somebody told you that they thought it meant. But you don't have one that says it. I got one that says don't forbid. And if you are, you're violating the word of God. Anyway, thank you. Hallelujah. But notice here. And, and notice he says, that He that speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So we, when we pray in tongues, we're speaking to God. We're not speaking to men. It also says here that in the Spirit, He speaks mysteries or divine secrets. What are you doing? We're communing with the Father, Spirit to Spirit. Your Spirit is in divine connection with the Father of Spirits, and you're communing, hallelujah, outside the realm of understanding and outside the realm Satan understands. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, it's, it's kind of like um, you walk into a room and you got some people there and, and, and you're talking to them in English and carrying on conversation. All of a sudden they turn around and start speaking in uh, uh, Russian. And you're sitting there going, now I recognize that's an Eastern, Eastern language. I understand that. I can, I can tell from the way they're saying things that's probably Eastern European or Russian or something like that. But you don't understand the thing they're saying. Guess what? You might know they're saying something. But it ain't helping you understand a thing. They could be talking about deep mysteries from the Word of God. They could be talking about where they're going to go eat dinner. What if they, what if they were talking about where they're going to go eat dinner in Russia and you're sitting there going, and they say, okay, let's go. And, I, and you say, where are you going? We, we just said. Yeah, but I couldn't understand it. Why? Well, you were speaking to each other in a language that only each other stood, understood. Amen? Hallelujah. See, when you commune with the Father, Satan could be standing right there listening to the whole conversation. When you commune in tongues, he don't understand a thing. You're speaking a language only you and the Father understand. Hallelujah. And he just has to sit there and look dumbfounded, which he does most of the time anyway. <coughs> Hallelujah. But then Paul goes on and says, so we talked about that last week. Then Paul goes on and says in verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Look with me, if you will, over into the 20th verse of the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter, so it's really not even, you could say Jude 120, but um, however you want to do it, it's fine, 120 or just Jude 20. Glory to God, if you want to take each, each verse as a chapter, you can do that. It doesn't matter, because you're going to still find Jude 20. Whether it's Jude 120, Jude chapter 20, Jude 20, nothing else, it's still the same thing. Jude says here, but ye beloved, building up, let's back up, let's back up. But beloved, verse 17, remember the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last days which should walk after the ungodly lust. These being, these be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved. Now, the inference here is we have the Spirit. Amen. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now, notice praying in the Holy Ghost doesn't produce faith. It builds it up. Amen. Praying in the Holy Ghost doesn't produce, why? Because Romans chapter um, 10 verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes from the Word. But you can build up your faith, you can energize your faith, or you can empower your faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Remember, Paul also wrote in one place, he said, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So you can get so wordy, you get dry as the Sahara Desert. Hello? Are you here? Or you can get so crazy, you can get like a hamster on double, uh, on, on a monster, what, is it, what do we call those monster drinks? Monster, the monster drinks? On one of those big cans, a monster drink. Put it in this water. You see, the hamsters are lunatics anyway. Get, put them on double, triple caffeine, and they, man, they'd be like bing, 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 bing all over the cage. So you get people who get so spiritual, they're really not spiritual, but they think they are, get so spiritual, they act like a bunch of loony bins. Hello. The situation, well, um, um, 
uh, some people we know, they were in an apartment and they were in the flying floor and some people above them thought they were real spiritual and they're having a Holy Ghost meeting. And they're up there prophesying and screaming and they're all falling on the floor and, you know, bouncing off the walls and dancing, having them a Holy Ghost meeting. Yeah, chandeliers are shaking downstairs. Yeah. Yep, had to call security on the Holy Ghost meeting. It wasn't a Holy Ghost meeting, it was a flesh meeting. Yeah, right. There wasn't anybody there to oversee it. There wasn't, there wasn't anybody there that was spiritual. They could say, look, you guys are, you know, this, this isn't the Holy Ghost. You're just, you're just giving into the flesh. Hello. See, the Word of God, no, first of all, the Word of God would have told them, you know, that everything's really done decently in order. And, you know, listen, I'm going to tell you something. See, we, we, we charismatic. Can I talk about us? Now, listen, if the Baptists talk about us, everybody gets mad. So, but I'm not Baptist. All right, so I can talk about us. Now, listen, I'm going to say something here. It's okay because a lot of times what the Baptists said were right. But you, just because it was a Baptist saying it, we couldn't, they, they, you get mad. So I'm not Baptist. Well, I guess you could say I am. I'm baptized into the, into the body of Christ. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost, and I've been baptized in water. Hallelujah. And I've been baptized in some fire here and there, too. So I'm Baptist, Baptist. All right. Hallelujah. You know, but listen, you know, listen, don't, just, just, just don't re, you know, reject criticism just because it came from a source you don't think knows anything. Hello. A lot of things we've done under the guise of being in the Spirit is just pure flesh. Why? Because when you go back to the Word, it doesn't line up with the Word. Hello. Prophesying all over people. Amen. Did you know the Bible talks about your prophecies being judged? Yeah. I know people who won't let you judge their prophecies. Well, don't you put your hands on my head. Hello? I don't want you laying your hands on my head prophesying on me if it can't be judged. Are you here? You've gone home. No, see, you can, get so, you can get so spiritual, and it's really not spiritual, but they think it is. They think because if you're speaking in tongues and acting crazy and falling and all that, that that's the Holy Ghost. I've seen people in healing lines go down and fall and get nothing. People stand right there and not fall and get healed. Yes, I've seen people get filled with the Holy Ghost and didn't have a bit of emotion. And others get act like a bunch of crazy maniacs bouncing off the walls and didn't get anything. Yes, I've seen a lot of things. Amen. <clears throat> let's, let's, not, let's not relegate everything to certain things in our mindset. Let's let God be God. Yeah. Amen. I mean, there, there are times the Spirit of God will come on you and you, you yield to that and you can have a wild service. But what happens a lot of times is the next night everybody wants to come in and have that same wild service. They want to do it in the flesh. Now, I know a minister. I, I've had a minister. We've been in our church a number of years ago. He's right here. He's a prophet. I mean, now, let me tell you something. Back, you know, and, and I think he's, he probably learned a lot since then. But back then, I tell you, one night, the Lord told him to throw water on the congregation. He grabbed the pitcher of water. They had the glasses of water. They had a pitcher of water on the platform. He grabbed that. It just went in and went. Shoo! Everybody in that section got healed or baptized in the Holy Ghost or saved or whatever. Next night, came back, did the thing. Same thing. Everybody in that section got wet. <laughs> Because, see, if the Holy Ghost is hitting in it, yeah, right. you just tried to pull the same button, push the same button, and pull the same lever, and all you got was everybody wet. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can wet a bunch of Christians who got, the, especially women. Because charismatic women, they love their makeup. And they love their jewelry. And they love their hairspray at one, at one time. I mean, they, 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 man, they get it up, baby. <laughs> everybody thought they were supposed to follow Tammy Faye and, and Jane Crouch. Wear the wigs, pink wigs even. Hallelujah. You go wetting down somebody's pink wig, you're going to get a fight on your hands. Are you here? You're going home. I'm, I'm just rambling here. I'm not rambling. I've got a purpose in this. Um, see, we, we want to relegate things of the Spirit to some experiences we've had. And things of the Spirit aren't based on your experiences. They are based on the Word of God. Because, see, the Word and the Spirit agree. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Holy Ghost, come on, you can dance in the Spirit. Run in the spirit. You can have Holy Ghost meeting. You know, and I honestly, I'll be honest with you. Just because you're not dancing, you're not shouting, you're not ter jumping chairs and hanging from the uh, chandeliers, doesn't mean it's not a Holy Ghost meeting. Right. What do you mean? See, a Holy Ghost meeting is really when whoever is, is ministering or in charge has yielded the flow of the service to the Holy Ghost, whether it's teaching, preaching, like ministering in the spirit, doing certain things, or if, if, if you just get it and have a Bible lesson, that can be a, that can be a Holy Ghost meeting. Amen. Actually, every, every service should be a Holy Ghost meeting. Yeah, right. But now let me say this. You don't run a church the way you run a, a, a camp meeting. Right. 
Hello. I said, you don't run a church the way you run a camp meeting. Why? That's a different, that's a different set. It's a different purpose. You can't come together. I, 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 you, know, you can't come together and run every service. It's not about running laps. Now, if the Holy Ghost comes on you and you, you, you yield it to the Spirit and you're doing something like that uh, as, an ex, as an expression of joy or, or whatever, and God's doing something in your life setting you free, praise God. Yeah. But you can't come run every service. Yeah. You might get in good shape physically. <laughs> Hello? Man, I can run with the best of them. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. Yeah, but are you, are you taking time to hear the Word? Yeah. And grow. Now, that's, I, I, now that's on the other side of the thing. You get on the, uh, we don't believe in that stuff. We just, we just need the Word. No, no, you've got have, to have the Holy Ghost, too. Oh, yeah. You need the Word and the Spirit. But you don't run your services the way you run a Holy Ghost or a camp meeting or a special service, a series of services with a special speaker and that kind of stuff. You, your church has to be run where, where you minister to the whole man and minister. On, listen, pastors have to preach stuff that nobody wants to hear. I don't see many traveling ministers out there coming and talking about how to be balanced in your approach to biblical prosperity. <laughs> now they all want to come in and tell you you're going to get rich overnight, you're going to have supernatural debt cancellation. I mean, you're just going to give me this big offering, it's going to be a thousandfold anointing on me tonight, and you're going to be, you're going to be debt free next week. You don't get big crowds telling people you've got to be frugal and tithe. So that gets left to the pastor. And then people want to send all the money to the guys going to tell them they're going to be rich overnight. Hello. See, we got, we got to get a better understanding of things. Now, let me say this. See, there's, there's, been a, there's been a breach in the relationship between the traveling minister and the churches because the traveling ministries were taking so much money out of the churches. That shouldn't be. The, the traveling minister, whether he's a teacher, prophet, whatever he is, should be coming in to edify and build and help strengthen the local church. Now, a lot of people say, well, I, but by giving to my ministry and calls me, you know, they'll, 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 get to have, they'll be rich and they'll give more money to your church. I, I don't buy into all that stuff. They give to God. They give the way God said give. You teach, if you teach people to do right and you're a traveling minister, God will take care of you the same way he's going to take care of the pastor and the local church. Da, 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 da. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Of course, I don't have any travel ministers sitting here doing all that, so you guys should be really shouting. It's the ones listening to me on the internet are going, I don't, I ain't ever going to his church again. Well, that's your problem. You'll miss out. You get blessed when you come to our church. I guarantee it. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, where was that before I got off with all that? Spirit. <laughs> Edify of himself. Yep, we were in June 20, weren't we? And we read verses 14, 15, 16, 17, around there, 18. And then we read verse, verse 19, didn't we? Amen. But build, but build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And we, say, we started out in all that. We kind of we took a little side journey saying that faith doesn't come by praying in the Holy Ghost. Faith comes by hearing the Word. Right. But you build yourself up. Why? Because when you're, built, when, you, when you're in communion, remember what happens? What happens? We kind of hit this a little bit last week. But what happens when you pray in tongues? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but speaketh unto God. Come on, church. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. This is not the first church of the frozen chosen. All right? I am begging for a response that is worthy of this congregation. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but speaketh unto God. Good job. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what I'm looking for. Not, not some weenie response. God. Hallelujah. God. All right. Howbeit no man understandeth him, for in the Spirit he speaketh. Mysteries. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh not unto I mean, no man understandeth him, for he speaketh. Mysteries. Mysteries or? Divine Come on. Divine secrets. When you're communing with God in tongues, praying in the Spirit, what's happening? You're building your relation, your, your fellowship, not really relationship, but you're building your, we use this term so interchangeably in modern languages, you know, when we start teaching along certain lines, people get uptight because you use the wrong word. And they get into semantics, missing the point. You know, oh, I'm born again, I got a relationship with God. Well, okay, we're talking about fellowship. 
getting to know him. Just because you're born of him doesn't mean you know him. Right. I said, just because you're born of him doesn't mean you know, you know him. Amen. I said, I will. I said, just because you're born of him does not mean you know him. Does not mean you have an epinosis of the Father. Clear, precise, accurate knowledge through experience or experientially. How does that take place? Fellowship. The epinosis of God takes place through fellowship. And one of the prime, one of the most important means of communing with the Father is how be it in the spirit no man understandeth him because he speaketh mysteries or divine secrets unto God. When you commune with the Father. Oh, hallelujah. I said, when you commune with the Father, you are developing an epinosis of him. There's a Greek word that talks about knowledge. One of, the word, one of the words is epinosis, which is that clear, precise, accurate, experiential knowledge. This is not a head knowledge. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now listen. You can be told that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That is abstract. Writing on a piece of paper, it's, I don't care how you look at it, that is still an abstract concept. One of, the, one of the worst things they've done in our math educational systems is, is they've removed almost uh, across the board manipulatives. Because you take a kid and say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and they look at those numbers going, okay, give them two apples and two apples and let them take the two apples and put them together and have four. It's, a, it's it what? That's been an experience there. They've handled something And it connects on a different level. It doesn't connect on this. Well, I have to remember that two represents two items. And two more items. And that gives me four items. The manipulative reinforces something at a deeper level. And we've done it. Modern, modern math and all this kind of doing away with all that kind of stuff. Wow. You got a bunch of idiots running everything. All right. I don't know how to say it. Yeah. All this outcome-based education and all this kind of stuff. We're, we're trying to teach stuff and we're trying to use modern math and stuff like this. They didn't use modern math a thousand years ago. Those guys are more smarter than, than anybody's talk, teaching today. Those guys that were in the universities and stuff 500, 600 years ago, I blow, the, blow the stuff away today. They guys, oh, we, well, technology, yeah, but see, computers are doing so much of that that the guys really don't know what they're doing, a lot of them. Computers doing it all. Hello. Now, I programmed an RPG, too. You know what? Dick programmed in COBOL. What else did you program in? Fortran. Fortran. Oh, yeah. I was good for I love Fortran. Anybody know what Fortran stands for besides Dick? And the bill. <laughs> All right. All right. It was, uh, they used to say it was a kind of a sloppy form of basic, and it was a scientific language called formula translation. Hallelujah. Just want anybody to know. I knew. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But you know what? Even when you're programming in those languages, they're really running on top of Usually, back then, at least in, in most of your main components were running on top of assembler, which ran on top of binary. Yeah. And the guys who could program down here at hex or binary, they're the guys who really made the money. Yeah. Those, were the, those were the guys when they came out, got off work, and you looked at them, and they took off their shades, they had little CRT screens burned in on their eyeballs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> They've been front out computer screens so long. It just, zzz, zzz. Yeah, listen, I mean, you know, programming in, 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 in the, higher, the, the upper level languages are moving. I guess the, the, the other one's called mid-level languages. Your, your visual-based programming now is the high level. We just use objects. You don't do object-oriented programming. You don't even know what's going on. You just put, oh, I put this little picture here and it does that. Oh, that's cool. I'm a programmer. No. You're a picture putter together. <laughs> Programmers actually go and do stuff. All right. Anyway, how did I get off on all that? Apples aren't. Apples aren't. But no manipulatives. You see, a lot of times we get so, at, we, we become, well, I know God. Well, no, you don't know God. You know about God. You've heard some stories, but you haven't had the two apples and the two apples and come up with four apples. You haven't had the clear, precise, accurate experiential knowledge of the things of God because you haven't communed with him. It's good. You're not going to get it because Sandy gets up and testifies that the Lord gave her a thousand dollars this week out of the blue. Uh, 
you'll get blessed. With, oh, that, but you're not, you're not going to know God because of her experience. Hello? You have to come to the place of the uponosis of God. And one of the key methods of that is praying in the Spirit and communing with Him. And as you do such, if faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and faith is, it begins where the will of God is known. Now let me say something. Uh... Jeff! Matthew tells you he's going to give you $1,000 at the end of the service today. Now what are you going to do? Are you really going to believe he's going to do that? Why? You don't know him well enough to know if one, he has it. Two, he would do it even if he did have it. What's that based on? Why is that? Why are you in that place? There is a lack of an epinosis in your relationship. You don't have a clear, precise, and accurate knowledge of Matthew's will, intent, and abilities. Now, Matthew could come to you and say, hey, you know what? Last week, Deneen came to church. I gave her $1,000. And I'm going to give you one today. Now, you might be going, woo, but I'll tell you where you're going next. Name. <laughs> Come here, girl. I got to talk to you <laughs> and do some investigating. Yeah, he gave me $1,000 last week. Now, wait a second. But you still don't have a clear, precise, accurate knowledge because you don't know if he'll do it for you. Right. Now, on the other hand, Gina comes to Greg and says, Greg, uh, I got $500. I just, got, I just picked up $500, and, I, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to give that to you this afternoon when you get on. She calls on the phone. I'm going to give that to you when you get home this afternoon so you can go do this with it. Let me say something. When Greg doesn't wonder right. all day long if when he gets home, Gina going to give him the money. That's just something I don't know about. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay, all right. <laughs> Why? They have a clear, they know each other. When she tells him, I got 500 bucks and I'm giving it to you, he's coming to the door. Okay, wait, where is it? Right. Yeah. He don't wonder. Why? They've had, a clear, they've had a clear, precise, accurate, experiential knowledge of each other in knowing that when one says something that they're going to either, they do it or they're not going to lie to each other. Right. She's not going to call that and mess with him like that. <laughs> Psych! Ah, yeah, a laugh, baby. He been out all day long, man. And he's, he's got his head. I'm, I'm paying this off. I'm paying that off. I'm taking this. I'm doing this. I'm even gonna take the family out to Ruth's Chris for supper. Hallelujah! Had that all planned out. Psych, Buster! Ah, I messed it with you, dude. He knows she's not gonna do that to him. Why? Because of their epinosis of each other. They've communed. They've been together long enough and communed together long enough. They know when one's joking, when one's telling the truth, when one's messing with you. When, you understand? And when you commune with God in the Spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. See, Greg has, hey, Greg, I mean, I could be eating, eating breakfast with Greg. And Gina called him and tell him that. Pastor, praise God. And Gina just called and said she got $500. And when I get home, she's giving it to me. And I'm going to pay off all these bills we got out there. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'll rejoice with him. Yeah. He starts to tell why. He knows. He's in faith. He knows it's happened. It's good. He knows. There's no doubt. There's no wonder. It's good. Yeah. Let me say this. When they first got married, that wasn't necessarily true. Why? Wow, they didn't know each other. You no, know, well... Did she really get $500 this morning? Or is she in faith? Is she trying to you know, call something in or whatever? I mean, whatever. Yeah. But over time, yeah. over time, that epinosis comes clear, precise, and accurate yeah. because it's experiential. Yeah. Now, we're not, we don't base our faith on experiences, but this kind of knowledge is based on experiential interaction. And this comes from an experiential interaction with the Father. You come to know him. 
you know. See, because you've experienced his presence, you've experienced communing with him, you know he says what he says and means what he says and was going to do what he says. You've come into an epinosis with God and one of the, 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 according to the word of God, one of the best ways and the clearest ways is praying in the spirit. It's not the only way. I'm saying, you know, you, that doesn't mean you don't pray in your, your language. I'm not saying that. And don't say you don't come to know him by praying. You know, I'm saying one of the ways and, and, and the best way because it's undefiled. There's no, there's, there's no personal changing it. Now, how many been married and one say something and, other, and you hear something different? Over time, you learn. Now, my wife, you know, when she hears me go, great! It doesn't mean something good just happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, Ed! She didn't come and go, whoa, honey, what happened? Woo! It's, what did you tear up? What did you drop? What did you break? <laughs> what? Honey, what's wrong? Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> in a squawky voice. <laughs> We're going to get ourselves in trouble, buddy. Shut up. <laughs> if, I, if I do that, you hear, honey, what's wrong? She, she didn't want nothing great going on. Amen? Now, when we first got married, I may have done that, and she would have gone, what? Nothing. Well, you said great. Well, it wasn't really great. It was bad. I was... <laughs> okay? You, you learn each other. When you commune with God, you learn God. When you pray in the Spirit and commune with Him, then you go to His Word because you've been communing. You've had a, an epidosis of with God and communing with Him. And you open up His Word and you get to 1 Peter 2.24. It was on self by our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed. And suddenly the God of your communion, the God whom, with whom you have an epinosis with, a clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of him. Because you've been communing with him. And then you look at his word and his word says by his stripes you were healed. There's no doubt you've built yourself up on your faith. Because you know he meant what he said when he said it. And see, by praying in the Holy Ghost, you can build yourself up on your faith. Most holy faith. Hallelujah. Oh, my. And then you open up the Bible and you look in there and say, well, my father, I just communed with him. Hallelujah. I know more of him than I knew this morning because I just spent time communing with him. And my clear, precise, and accurate experience or knowledge of him has gone to a deeper level. And he said... As he moved by his spirit on holy men to write that by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. Yeah. Hallelujah. His word produces the faith. My communion, praying in the Holy Ghost, has built it up in me. Praise God. And I said, Praise God. Amen. And that trust that has developed, because that's what really happens, you begin to trust. Satan can come and say, he didn't mean that. He wasn't, oh, listen, uh-uh, shut, shut up, Satan. Don't you accuse my father. I know him in intimate ways you can't even fathom. He keeps his word. Now, can you imagine Gina calling Greg and I'm at breakfast with Greg and she tells him I got $500, I'm going to give it to you when you get home. And I look at him and say, your wife's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, besides check, please, there's probably going to be a discussion about uh, defaming the character of the woman that he's had epinosis with. Hello. And how dare you accuse her of being a liar? Yeah. Now, if you want to take this outside, we'll talk about it out there. <laughs> I don't care what you say. Your wife's a liar. Lying like a hound dog on a hot summer afternoon on the front porch. What do you think about that? <laughs> Hello? I don't care if you're the pastor. I'll slap you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, why? Because he knows she's tell she, she doesn't lie. He know it doesn't matter what I say at that point. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what I say at that point. 
There is an intimacy and in, in experiential knowledge with each other that my words have no power over. And when you come to that place with the Father and Satan comes to accuse God of not telling the truth, there is an intimacy between you and the Father that his words have no power over. Amen. Hallelujah. And you can stand face to face and he can say God's a liar and you can say, boy, let's take it outside. I know my God. He is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. I know my God. If he said it, that's the way it is. Glory to God. Because I have spent time with him. And I know him. I don't know who you think you are, but I know him. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Y'all get blessed yet? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's why we pray in tongues. See, see, the, the problem we did with the, in, the, in, the, in the Pentecostal circles in the early days is we got so caught up with the tongue, speaking in tongues. Are you here? That we missed the purpose and the meaning behind the experience or what God was trying to do. And we got caught up battling over, you know, this and that and all those other things. And we weren't taking advantage. I mean, we used to have Pentecostals. They'd seek the Holy Ghost for years. Have a guest speaker come in, they'd get filled with the Holy Ghost, and you wouldn't see him for two, three weeks, and somebody see him out on the street, hey, ain't seen you in church since, since that night at the church. Yeah, didn't you hear? I got it. What? Yeah, I got the baptism. See, they thought they had to tarry to get the Holy Ghost, wait on the Lord, and miss the whole point of get filled with the Holy Ghost and then wait on God. Yeah. It wasn't get filled with the Holy Spirit so you can stop coming. That's your red badge of courage. You got, you got it. No, get filled so you can enter into these other places with God. Enter into these other, uh, other venues with God. Enter into this epinosis. Enter into, you know, the rest of God. Enter into com divine communication. All these things and these benefits and, and the profitability of praying in tongues. Praise God. Amen. See, devil, if the devil can't push you out of something, he'll push you over in something. Yeah. He couldn't put, keep people out of stuff, so he got, them over, all, got everybody all caught up with saying, speaking in tongues of the devil and everybody fighting. Why? Because if, if he keep them fighting, they could never get, they could never get to the place where they were just taking advantage of the benefits of being filled with the Spirit and coming to the epinosis, building up themselves on the most holy faith, walking in a new place with God and becoming strong believers by taking advantage of what God had provided for them. So we build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Amen? Amen. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Next Sunday we're going to finish. Actually, next Sunday is Mother's Day. I might just mess up the devil and do a Mother's Day sermon. <laughs> I don't do those often. I think I've maybe done two in all the years we've been here. I don't like special day sermons. I feel like a dog on a leash. But you know what? I have done a few occasionally. So bring mom. We might have one. Then again, we might not. You just never know with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen.